Well, good morning to uh, each of you. It's a pleasure to welcome you to this uh, Director's Forum with Dr. Wayne Clough. He is the 12th Secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. He's a member of the Wilson Center's Board of Directors. I also want to recognize uh, Dr. Brent Glass, who is the Director of the National Museum of American History. You've had a spectacular changeover there, incidentally, in recent uh, weeks. And Judith Leonard is here. She's the Smithsonian's general counsel. She and her office are often very helpful to the Wilson Center. Um, the Wilson Center is extremely proud to operate under the Smithsonian umbrella under the leadership of Dr. Clough. As you all know, the Smithsonian Institution is simply one of the most impressive institutions in the world. A spry 163 mm -hmm. years old, the Smithsonian is comprised of 19 world-class museums, nine research centers, of which the Wilson Center is one, and the National Zoo. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I don't want you to make too close an association between the Wilson Center and the National Zoo, although I must say to you I've seen some similarities uh, from time to time. Uh, Dr. Clough is a man in the Wilsonian mood, an accomplished leader and a scholar. This month marks the end of his first year as Secretary. It's been an eventful one. I'm sure he'll be commenting on that in Washington and around the world. Uh, so you know a little about his background. He served as president of the Georgia Institute of Technology, most of us call it Georgia Tech, for 14 years. And he transformed Georgia Tech into one of the country's premier public universities. During his time in Atlanta, he oversaw increases in research expenditures from $212 million to $425 million, a nearly 40% increase in student enrollment, $1 billion building program, and the internationalization of the university, including opening campuses in Ireland, Singapore, and China. Prior to his tenure as president, he taught at Duke, Stanford, Virginia Tech, was provost at the University of Washington. He's a recent inductee of the Technology Hall of Fame of Georgia, recipient of the Joseph N. Pettit Alumni Distinguished Service Award that recognizes a lifetime of leadership, achievement, and service to Georgia Tech, and he serves on a good many boards and advisory panels. He's a native of Georgia, holds a doctorate in civil engineering from the University of California, Berkeley, his academic specialty is geotechnical and earthquake engineering. He's published more than 130 papers and reports in six book chapters and has co-written numerous committee reports. A very distinguished uh, record. Today he will be speaking on new connections, new, contrib uh, new contributions at the Smithsonian. Dr. Clough. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. After he speaks, he'll take a few questions. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction, and uh, you're giving me way more credit than I deserve because any time you work at a great institution like the Smithsonian or Georgia Tech, there are a lot of people who make good things happen. Uh, being a university president and being secretary of the Smithsonian are really two different things with many similarities. I uh, tell people that the universities have football teams and we don't. Uh, but we have a zoo, and universities don't have zoos, so they're sort of a trade-off there. Uh, but they're both creative institutions and both institutions that, that are really all about learning and helping, if you are an American university, helping the American public become more educated and therefore able to live fuller lives and helping people understand our country as well. And the Smithsonian certainly is in that vein for a national interest uh, of our country. So it's a pleasure to be here, especially to be here with Lee, who I think is a leader emblematic of what public service really means and, and how important it is to our country. I think that President Obama uh, is working hard to reinstill uh, the importance of public service to our country. 
And you don't have to look far to find someone like Lee who represents the best in that mode. And so it's a pleasure to be here and an honor to be with Lee. Uh, it's great to have some of my Smithsonian colleagues here and, and Brent being one of those. Uh, Brent had a uh, milestone the other day. Uh, he reopened his museum after two years being closed uh, and has already celebrated his three, three millionth visitor. And to put that in perspective, if you want to get on the list of the world's most visited museums, I'm not a museum expert, I'm beginning to learn a little, uh, you've got to have at least a million visitors a year. And so you can see three puts you way up there. Uh, number one on the list is probably the Louvre, although we would argue collectively the Smithsonian dwarfs the Louvre, but uh, if you look at individual museums, and the Louvre is at about seven to eight. So American history is way up there in terms of its visitorship, and we're pleased because that's very important for us. And it is a testament, again, to Brent's leadership and his colleagues who do such a great job. Also with me is Judith Leonard, who is the new general counsel of the Smithsonian, and John Yonner, who worked with us on our research studies and helps me write remarks such as those as I will deliver today. It is certainly an honor to serve as, and a privilege to serve as secretary of the Smithsonian uh, and uh, to represent that great institution. Uh, as you know, it was created 163 years ago uh, in part because the whimsical act of an Englishman who never came to this country but who decided to leave his estate to our country for the creation of an institution for the increase and diffusion of knowledge in the nation's capital. And I'll tell people if you want to think of us as a federal entity, you might because somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of our funding comes from the federal government. But on the other hand, uh, we are, don't have a specific mission other than that generic mission that was given to us uh, by Mr. Smithson and was adopted by Congress. Uh, most of the federal entities that you, we would uh, be compared to in some way because we do get appropriations uh, have some mission because they do something specific. For example, when the United States got in the business of having wars, somebody said, well, let's better get organized here. So you need a Department of Defense. And when it started building roads, we needed the Department of Transportation. And so those entities have a very specific mission. The Smithsonian's mission is very broad. Increase in diffusing knowledge. That's just what it is, and it's a wonderful thing. Uh, also, we are a bit of a hybrid, just like the Wilson Center is. Uh, and uh, depending upon the circumstances, we can emphasize one of the other side that we have. One side is the private side, because we are, have private resources at the Smithsonian, endowment, fundraising, those kind of things. And on the other side is government appropriation side. And depending on the circumstances, we sort of lean one way or the other uh, when we see it to match our good interest. But we, in, the, in the end, we're here to serve our country. Well, I think the Smithsonian really is moving into a new era. We're doing some strategic planning, and recently a participant said about every three or four generations, the Smithsonian has to rethink its, pur rethink its purpose and, and redefine its, its, uh, what it's going to do with itself about every three or four generations. And so if you think about that, that's if you look at the Ripley era where the Smithsonian was in a very dynamic mode, we've gone through that cycle, and it's really time for us to rethink of what we are going to do, and we have great opportunities ahead of us. I think it has a vital and, and important role in the future of our country, and in fact the world, because we are a global institution. We will focus ourselves probably on three grand challenges. There will be a few more, but I'll just cite these. First, uh, in the area of science, we will be working on issues such as global warming and biodiversity. Now, the Smithsonian has been working on many of these issues for a long time. It's just that their relevance has become so much more important today. And that's where the redefining part comes in, is that we can capture uh, these uh, issues in ways we didn't see them before. And secondly, education. Education, because the Smithsonian is at heart an educational institution. We have a website that's si.edu. We are an educational institution, and through our exhibits, obviously, we are there to help educate people about the important issues that we face. Uh, but in addition, we think we have a much bigger role in education, and I'll describe that shortly. And then finally, issues of national identity. And why is that important? We are close to that great milestone in this country where there will be no majority in this country in, in terms of its racial and ethnic background. And the question is, what holds this country together? 
And it is a common heritage. It is understanding the sacrifice that all the different streams that have come together to make this country what it is. Uh, and we have to understand that sacrifice through a common lens. And I think the Smithsonian is one of the few institutions that truly can focus on that, what it means to be an American. Not only for us telling ourselves about it, for those who are still immigrating into this country and those who are born fresh to this country who don't appreciate the depth of our history, but also to explain us to our uh, the, the other countries in the world that we want to be friends with. So that's important today. So these are the things I'll comment on uh, in my remarks. Well, uh, as the secretary of the Smithsonian, and given that I've been there about a year, I've had a chance to see the Smithsonian in a way few others will ever be able to do because I've been offered that opportunity. Uh, and it involves, in some cases, uh, more than just hanging around the mall because the Smithsonian is, in fact, in 88 different countries in one way or another, and we are in many locations in the United States. It is often uh, not understood by individuals. We have two museums in New York City, the Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum and the High George Gustav High Center, American Indian Center there, and so we have activities there. One-sixth of our employees work in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and they are about the business of astronomy and astrophysics. And they are there as part of the Smithsonian Harvard uh, Astronomy Work, Astrophysics Observatory, which moved there in the 50s, 1950s. It just outgrew them all, and it moved into that location. <clears throat> so uh, I've had uh, the great pleasure of visiting Smithsonian activities outside the bounds of our country, not only inside but outside. Uh, and that involved going to Panama, where we have about 600 people working at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute, whose roots are founded in the Panama Canal and the construction of the canal, and thoughtful people at that time saying, we need to understand what we're doing to the flora and fauna of this uh, wonderful land. And in addition, realizing that for the first time in three million years, man would reconnect two oceans. Because up to that time, three million years ago, the isthmus had separated them. And so connecting them, interesting things happen. Uh, and so it has been proven. Fascinating uh, story just yesterday about the construction of the new locks at the Panama Canal and the Smithsonian's uh, relationships and making use of those deep excavations to study where the isthmus really came from and what may true, truly happen to it in the future. It's a remarkable place in the world about plate tectonics. I'm a geologist, so I had to get that one in there. Okay, so the Smithsonian is also unique uh, in addition to being in these different places. I mentioned Chile and Kenya. Uh, Chile, because of astronomy, we have connections to the Carnegie Institutions, uh, great telescopes there, and we're about building a big one with them. And Kenya, we're involved in biodiversity, a 50,000-acre science reserve in Kenya uh, with Princeton, a trust, and the Kenya Wildlife Service. It's a great chance for me to see those things up close and personal. But the Smithsonian is also a place where history, art, and culture come together. There are great art museums. There are great natural science museums in this country and in the world. The Smithsonian is the only one that does all of these things. And so really our job is to make sense of how all these pieces fit together. And it does offer us, I think, a remarkable opportunity because these things do come together in such a wonderful way. Our science activities, I'll speak to that just a little bit, as I mentioned, take place in many countries around the world. And the physical basis for much of this work is actually not on the mall. Uh, it starts with the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center up at Edgewater, Maryland. We have 3,000 acres, 16 miles of pristine shoreline on the Chesapeake Bay, where we do research about the health of that great body of water, which is not just about that body of water. It's about climate change, and it's about survival of the species. And I can tell you it ain't looking too good right now if you look at the research that's being done there. There's a lot of, lot of challenges for the Chesapeake Bay, mirrored, for example, in Puget Sound in Washington and other places as well. That's an important bit of research. The National Zoo, Lee mentioned the National Zoo. It is a research-based institution. It was founded because an early secretary was very concerned about loss of species diversity in the West, brought animals back here to Washington to see if they could be bred and therefore preserved in some way and reintroduced into the wild. Uh, we had buffalo at one time on the mall, and somebody at some point said, get them off the mall. <laughs> and so the National Zoo came into being, but P. 
people forget that the National Zoo is connected to 3,000 acres out in the mountains of Virginia where we do deep habitat studies and preserve species and breed them and reintroduce them into the wild all over the world. And so it is a deep research-based institution, is the zoo. And finally, I would mention the Smithsonian Marine Station at uh, Fort Pierce, which is a wonderful small facility down in Florida on the Indian River, uh, which uh, is, is a, an inherited inheritance that we uh, received some time back, allows us to do freshwater and saltwater interaction studies as well. And of course, the big, in, big one is the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institution. Wonderful place uh, where we can do marvelous work, incidentally, on carbon sequestration and the global climate change issues. Now, this month I will travel to Wyoming. In fact, in a week, I'll be traveling to Wyoming uh, to visit the field sites of a gentleman named Scott Wing, Dr. Scott Wing, who is a paleontologist and anthropologist uh, who's discovered unambiguous evidence for a period 55 million years ago when, in fact, there was climate change, very dominant climate change in our planet, probably the most dominant period since then and now. We worry, and you read the science articles, we're at 385 parts per million carbon. If you use carbon as an indicator, it's a problem uh, in our atmosphere. Uh, people say when we get to 440 or 450, wow. And where do they get the number? Well, they look in ice cores, and they go back 800,000 years in ice cores, and they see that, well, 440 is a big number if you look back there. But if you look back 55 million years ago, we probably had seven to 800 parts per million carbon in the atmosphere because a period occurred where all the carbon in the peat bogs, all the carbon sequestered in the ocean, and in many of the tropical forests was given up into the atmosphere and changed the chemistry uh, of that atmosphere. The difference being at that time, life went on merrily, but there weren't six billion human beings on the earth. And the question is, of course, what will happen if that occurs again and if man, in fact, drives it uh, and causes problems for these six billion people that we have on this planet? That is an interesting question. And so being able to look square in the face of what happened is very instructive. And Scott and his colleagues are doing exactly that. They can tell you exactly what happened, how long it took, and how long it lasted and it lasted for about 150,000 to 200,000 years. So when you get into this business, it's not something you change very quickly. So I would also argue that Scott's work would not have been possible without a number of breakthrough technologies that have been associated with our time. And there are many of those, for example, uh, 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 large-scale computing capabilities, uh, some of the new chemical and, and, and biological analysis tools, and so forth. And this is really opening up new areas of exploration for the Smithsonian across the board. <clears throat> At the Las Campanas uh, Observatory site in Chile, in the High Indies, where I visited, we are talking about building a telescope that would dwarf all telescopes, and that's the Giant Magellan Telescope. And it will allow us to see in space and, if you will, deep time because astronomy to some extent is about looking backwards because when light waves land here in a telescope on Earth, they've traveled a great distance and they represent an epoch or an event that happened many, many years ago. And so the bigger the telescope, the further back you're receiving the light waves, the further back in time you're looking. And our astronomers believe that the Earth was, uh, up there, sorry, the universe was created 14 billion years ago and the question is, can you see back 14 billion years ago? I can't answer that question, but it's certainly an interesting one. And the new giant Magellan telescope will tell us about the origins of the universe. And I think that will be very exciting. Now, of course, computing and the web have also opened up great new opportunities for us and for others. I'll just give you an example of a way that works at the Smithsonian. We're in the process of creating something called the Encyclopedia of Life. And the objective is a bold one, and that is to create a web page for every species of life on Earth, as far as we know it. And we don't know a lot, actually. But we believe there are 1.8 million individual species, flora and fauna included. Some would argue there may be 30 million. We just don't know it yet. But 1.8 million web pages is a pretty good number for us to work on. And so we are, in fact, working on that. We have about 160,000 species pages already up. And we've been helped by, this has all been done, it's been by private contributions, by foundations so far. 
is an important tool and device for understanding the web of life, how it all works together, and it's a great tool for teachers and students in now and in the future. Um, I think the important thing, though, is how it comes together in and around the Smithsonian. The Smithsonian is a great brand, a trusted brand, and what we're finding is teachers are coming into this website and starting to leave things on the website, like lesson plan. And the teacher will say, I looked through these things and I thought about a great lesson plan for my students and I thought I would share it with you. And they, then with their permission, we share it with other teachers. So suddenly it becomes a nexus for teachers to get together and share lesson plans around the country. That's, I think, the really drama that's associated with this. In addition, children are starting to use, they, you know, use different technologies than folks like me, they use their iPhones and take pictures of species on their field trips or in their backyards. And, of course, iPhones, if you read the New York Times today, uh, have GPS systems in them. Uh, and actually, GPS systems, it turns out, the sales are going down because iPhone technology is getting better. At any rate, they can tell us where they took the species, and our scientists can get back to those students and tell them, this is web page number 113,000. Find that one and you'll identify your species. And so we're beginning to get interactive between our scientists who are doing this mag magnificent work and young people who can be inspired by that work. So I think that's very important. Now, uh, I, I mentioned that science is important, but and, and I'm going to work to try to help people understand uh, more about our science. But as I mentioned also, this is one place where science, history, art, and culture come together. And so we want to celebrate all these separate strengths and then speak to what we can do where these things interact. That's something the Smithsonian is going to accomplish. No one else can accomplish. Our new president, President Obama, said, in a global economy where the most valuable skill you can sell is your knowledge, a good education is no longer just a pathway to opportunity. It is a prerequisite. And he warned that countries that outteach us today will outcompete us tomorrow. Well, at the Smithsonian, we've long been in the education business, and we have over 30 groups and units and entities and centers that do education because each and every one of our museums has an education outreach center. But those education centers don't talk to each other. And I think it's very important that we can do more, we believe, as we bring those together, to bring a focus, to bring a national presence. Let me give you an example of something we can do that we think others could not do. In February, for example, working with the Chief Council of State School Officers, we offered a very quiet pilot project, did not advertise it, about uh, Abraham Lincoln. This is 200th birthday, and we wanted to work with that. So one of those contributors certainly was the American History Museum. Turns out the Smithsonian has six exhibits on Lincoln, and I don't know how many of you have visited all six. Anybody here visited all six? No. Okay. I didn't think so. Uh, it, it's hard, actually. You know, you get museum fatigue after a while. Now, but what happened on the virtual learning exercise is on Monday and Tuesday, on Monday, three curators from three of the exhibits presented their exhibits, what they were, what Lincoln did with these objects, and how they were meaningful in his life and then allowed the students to ask questions to them, and this was students, at least nominally, we thought, all over our country. I'll tell you in a minute that that turned out not to be true. Uh, and, and we assumed that that would be a rich experience, and it was. But then on Tuesday, the other three did. And so those people who participated in the virtual exercise got to see all six of those that none of us in this room have seen, but they sought to see it. So the important thing is that the web allowed these students in places like my hometown of Douglas, Georgia, it's a small town. They don't have museums there. But they got to see all six of those exhibits and talk to the curators. And even if you'd seen all six of our exhibits, you didn't get to talk to the curators, but they did. And they're still talking to them by blogging. And so that was important. It turned out when I said it wasn't quite right, quite right that we would reach everywhere in the country. We did reach all 50 states and 2,000 cities, it turned out participated, but people from 75 countries tuned in. And we never thought people from other countries would be involved, but they did, and that's a good thing. Learning about Abraham Lincoln is one of the good things we can do instead of sending them the TV programs that we send them. This was a good thing. All right, so we think this is a pilot that illustrates how we can profoundly change education. 
Informal education has simply been seen as separate from formal in the past. Now is a chance for informal to play a much closer role to supplement. We'll never overtake formal, but to supplement what can be done in the formal sense. We will be doing a second of these in the fall on this time on global warming, where we have tremendous assets. And we will bring others in, Department of Energy and NOAA and so forth, to participate with us should they so choose to do so. Okay, I mentioned the business about our country getting more diverse. That's a power, it's a strength, as long as we see it that way. And we think our specimens and artifacts that we have, 137 million specimens, artifacts, and works of art, help tell stories. And they can tell the story of the strength of the different groups that make up, that make up the American uh, people and what it means to be an American. So we're working on that. We can make a significant contribution to the civic life of this country. Let me give you an example. Our Smithsonian American Art Museum has an exhibit called 1934, A New Deal for Artists. And it reminds us that in the worst of the Depression, in the 30s, Franklin Delano Roosevelt said there will be art. And he funded artists to, ex to explore the dimensions of what it was like to live in those times in our country. And you can have a wonderful time in seeing this exhibit. I would urge you to do so if you have not. It's important. Now, we had a meeting with some web types uh, not long ago in February, and one of those folks said in a suggestion, uh, well, where did you, which paintings did you choose, and how many do you have? I don't know the exact number. But let's just say we probably have 400 of these paintings, and we chose 30 to put on public display. And this person said, well, I'd like to see the rest of them. And so those are now on the web. And so if you want to go to the exhibit, you'll see what the curators chose for you to see. And if you want to see the rest of them, you get on the web and you can see all the rest of them. And so this is a new kind of thinking, is that in the future, curators and experts, uh, like folks like many of us, will not necessarily choose what people get to see or hear. The web will show them everything. And someday everything at the Smithsonian will be digitized, and you'll be able to see all 137 million of those objects, not just what we choose for you to see. I can assure you, you might not want to spend a lot of time looking at all 137 million things that we own. We have a great collection of specimens, 127 million beetles, insects, ticks, things like that. And the reason we have them is it's important. We are the national repository and work with the Department of Agriculture and, and our health organizations looking into the spread of infectious diseases by insects as well as the, the attacks that we have from beetles and so forth against our trees. Well, let me also mention another one of these kind of conversations. And I would refer to the National Museum of American History with its outstanding and spectacular Star Spangled Banner exhibition. Uh, it is an exhibition to me that I can go see time and time and time again and always get a sensation of excitement and thrill in seeing it. I would urge you to do so. I've had a chance to see it 20 times, and I never, never tire of it. Through light artifacts and interactive computer surfaces, you learn the inspiring story of how a flag, a very delicate and frail flag now, and an anthem took uh, over 100 years to become national artifacts for us, national symbols for us. And I, th I hope you also have seen the American President ex ex exhibition, and you ask people that question, they say, of course I have. I said, but did you see it recently? Because it changes. The more and more we're going to exhibitions that change in time. They aren't fixed. And so it's good to see those things change. And you can see artifacts from Woodrow Wilson's presidency, as a matter of fact, there. Tremendously educational. Now, when we open the doors to our 19th Museum, that will be the National Museum of American History and Culture. It will tell a story that all Americans should hear about the sacrifices and contributions made by African Americans to create this country. And it will be a very exciting day indeed in 2015 uh, when we open that museum. The National Museum of the American Indian is a different kind of museum in that it doesn't simply focus on America in our context that we might have, and that is the U.S. It is really about the Americas, because when the first people came to the Americas, there were no boundaries. There was no new United States, and yet they made lives for themselves and contributed in many ways to our ability to be here today. And so it's about telling 
those of us who are here today, what it was like for the first inhabitants of our land. And our challenge at the Smithsonian is to make this an engaging and interesting story, and we're working hard on that. In San Francisco a few months ago, I met with a group of new millennials. These are people younger than me, by definition. And uh, we talked about how we could reach their generation, because we know they communicate differently than we did. And we had a lovely conversation. It was very lively. And a young woman looked at me and said, if you want to reach me, you have to surprise me. You have to surprise me. And I don't think she meant just new and different. I think she really meant creatively engage me so that I will want to know more. And that's an important difference. In January, I mentioned we brought together a group of web experts with our people here at the Smithsonian who are doing some remarkable things with the web, and we had some very creative people speak to us. We worked with them to understand what they thought the future would be for the web and the Smithsonian. They gave us a set of what they call mind maps, which I still marvel at, uh, that give us insights about how we can connect to that new generation. If we're going to do the job we need to do, we have to connect to the next generation. And we have to use digital technology and interactive web social networking tools to connect to that generation. One of the people who participated, and they got a chance to go behind the scenes and do things that most of us don't get to do, uh, to meet interesting people at the Smithsonian who we think someday will be out from behind the walls because we'll use the technology to do so, and met one of our scientists. This young man met one of our scientists, and his comment was, wow, I met this cool old guy who explained the universe in five minutes. It was amazing. So we think generations can, in fact, speak to each other, and the Smithsonian can be the facilitator of that conversation. Let me give you a quick example of that, and sort of an only at the Smithsonian moment. Day before yesterday, uh, we had an interesting visitor at lunch who had asked and made a special request of us, which we like to do because this person happens to be a big, big supporter of the Smithsonian and in many of our different museums, not just one. A gentleman named Mickey Hart. He's the drummer for the Grateful Dead. Now, Mickey is a very creative guy. He's very interested now in the music of the universe. And he knows that if you put out recording instruments, even in your backyard, you'll pick up signals, noise. It looks like noise, but he sees it as music. Coming to us from distant planets, from black holes that make a different sound than other things. Uh, we know that the northern lights comes to us not only visually, spectacularly, but in the form of a sound, electronic storms and so forth. And Mickey's interested in this. So what was Mickey doing at the Smithsonian? He's left us some of his great artifacts in popular culture. But uh, he wanted to talk to our astronomers and our astrophysicists to say, what's the deal here? You know, can I really make something out of this? And how much artistic license can I take with it, right? And so he met with uh, Margaret Geller, who is an, uh, a, one of our senior scientists, uh, astrophysics, astrophysicist, who is a very, very interesting person from Cambridge, and David Devorkin, who is a senior curator at uh, Air and Space. And, and he himself is a very interesting guy. Rather well known to most of the public is the guy who wears a wizard's hat, which he enjoys in getting people engaged in conversation. And so the conclusion was, by George, yeah, there is music out there. We don't quite know what to do with it yet but Mickey's after it, and we're going to help him. And so that's the kind of thing that can happen there. And again, in terms of the surprise mode, if you saw the Washington Post or you were in the American Indian Museum, you might have seen that they had a skateboard exhibit set up because we often tend to view the American Indian in a sort of stuck paradigm of the Old West. Uh, they are, in fact, part of our modern culture, and it turns out American Indian youth are very good at skateboarding. Uh, and so they exhibit that ability at the Smithsonian. So I like to say the Smithsonian can really do things that surprise you, huh? So that goes back to what the young woman said in California. Surprise and creativity are both sides of the same coin. And with our resources, we think the Smithsonian is going to be both creative and, we hope, surprising. We think we can create conversations. We can't predict the future. We can certainly plan for it, and we're doing that. Uh, with our strategic planning process. We're trying to think about what will happen 10, 15 years from now with different futures as possibilities, but there's no doubt about it, the world will be different for the Smithsonian. We will be reaching more people. We will be reaching profoundly more people. 
Presently, just to take a number right now, last year we had about 25 million visitors. We think this year, thanks to American History and others, we'll be closer to 27 or more million. But through the web and through social networking, we could reach two and a half billion instead of 25 million. That's transformative. We can take our collections of 137 million objects and instead of having them hidden away in giant buildings out in Maryland, you can see them as much as you would like. And we can help you make something of those because we have hundreds, if not thousands of people who do remarkably creative work behind the walls of our museums and in these remote locations of the Smithsonian that you never get to meet that you would like to meet. They are cool people. I hope I'm one of those cool old guys that we're talking about. <laughs> they are interesting, interesting people doing things like Scott Wing that are going to profoundly change our understanding of the world. And so I hope my goal would be for the Smithsonian in this new era is that you have access to all of that. You own it. You own it. You own those collections. You should see them. And I believe we can do that in the future. And the Smithsonian have, will have a greater and a more profound impact on the world if we do that. So thank you very much for having me here. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Wayne. We'll have uh, a few questions here. I think we have microphones on both sides, and uh, we'll open it up for questions. Quite a few hands here. We'll begin over here. Yes. Thank you very much. My name is Walter Stavolo. I'm Director of International Relations at ASTEC, the Association of Science Technology Centers. We represent science centers and science museums worldwide as you probably yes. home. I'm running currently a program called International Action on Global Warming, mm -hmm. IGLU. And I'm interested in your event that you want to create in August, because from what I understand, you try to reach out to the world right. with that event. Uh, which we do in a way, and modestly, of course. Right. Uh, but I wonder how much you would w w listen to the world mm -hmm. and not only reach out, because sure. especially in global warming issues, even if the phenomena are very well known, right. the solutions mm -hmm. uh, are different in different parts of the world. And certainly people living in Africa have no message to things that we have about how to handle this. And I was wondering if you were interested in creating a dialogue between young people in different parts of the world with American young people to see how they have common views on how, sure. what we have to do to save the planet. Yeah. Well, good question and a good point. Uh, let me sort of get at that in a number of different ways. First, I would argue a little bit that we don't understand the phenomenon of global warming. We don't understand it from what's happening today as it might relate to what happened in the past. And one of the things that has come out of Scott's work and some of his colleagues is, in fact, if you look back 55 million years ago, there were a sequence of events that occurred. In other words, one triggered one, triggered another, triggered another. None of the climate models look at things this way. They tend to see things as more sequential. The climate change, obviously, the world's uh, Earth's climate is a very complex engine that we don't fully understand. So I think that's part of the research that we need to do to make sure we get a basis for understanding. And having said that, of course, the solutions, if there are solutions, are indeed very daunting, as President Obama and those who are trying to get legislation through uh, learning, are learning on the fly. And there's no question, in some ways, the, uh, the United States is not in a position to be what you would call on high moral ground about this issue. Uh, because we've done things that have indeed led probably to uh, accentuating global warming in the past by virtue of the way we made our energy choices, uh, what we've done to our forest. Uh, and one of the things I think the Smithsonian does is connect to the international audience in a way that others might not, because when we are in Panama and our Tropical Research Institute is, is doing something which I, is truly global, I'll mention this one because I think it comes to the point, and I'll talk about the dialogue in just a minute, but something called SIGEO, so Smithsonian Institution Ge uh, Geograph Observatory, uh, it, uh, Global Observatory. And what we're looking at is the health of forests. It started out looking at tropical forests because the Smithsonian was involved in work not only in Panama, but we do work in Brazil and many other places, Indonesia, where there are tropical forests. And so we have experts, all of, and they work with experts in those countries. So there is a dialogue on that basis, on that level. But SIGO was an effort then to say, let's create this as a worldwide endeavor. Let's engage people. And so we're not, quote, 
anything special in this other than a repository for the information and a, a convener. But we and other people know much more about their particular circumstances in their forest and sequestration in their part of the world. So we have four plots in China now. We have 24 different countries engaged in this, and we have probably close to 50 uh, locations around the world, and it's expanding. What we have tried to do with those, working with those countries, provide a common database. So everybody can go out and measure the health of trees, anything larger than about your thumb. We'll know about the health of that tree and, and the forest that it is in. And that information will flow into this common database that scholars all around the world can use as they look at things like modeling issues as well as trying to understand how fast climate change is occurring and how fast the trees are responding. And if the trees are responding and changing, which they are, then that means all the animals that depend on that canopy are changing as well. Something's going on. And so that's a fundamental thing the Smithsonian can do. Now, the dialogue itself is very important. I agree with you. We're not, as I said earlier, we, I think the Smithsonian and organizations like the Smithsonian are no longer in the position to be the expert. We are in a position now to, I would think, be an honest broker, to try to put information on the table that helps inform a dialogue, but encourages the dialogue. And that's where the web, social networking the web comes in. We are finding over and over again now that people know more about our collections than we do. That's why I'm excited about getting things on the web. There are people who will go through our exhibits and tell us things about an object that we didn't know. And so we are going to gain enormously if we open ourselves up to this dialogue and we help create it. So I think we can learn a lot, uh, a, a tremendous amount of what we're trying to do with the world. And, but the Smithsonian can be a place where we convene because we're kind of trusted in that sense. Okay, question here. Thanks. My name is Orish Dual. I'm here at the Wilson Center. Uh, I had a, a quick, short, specific question and a more broad one. Um, for the Lincoln virtual exhibit you described, how uh, how exactly was that? Um, like, was that webcast? How was that actually given? It was, it was all internet based. Okay, so like video video webcast. No, it, it, it was it was live. The the curator presentations were live. Of course, they were then put on servers, mm -hmm. and they could be held on the server for a period of time so people could access them by a time zone and not inconvenience anybody. Okay, thanks. And also, I was wondering, um, we uh, recently you had like a, a couple part discussion series uh, called SI 2.0. I was wondering what you thought were the most important parts uh, points to come out of it, and what are some of the changes that might come out of that as well. Well, I think one of the things that, that was useful for me, uh, and I think for my colleagues at the Smithsonian, was in part to find out what we were already doing. And we have some very bright people at the Smithsonian who are already doing some very interesting things with the web. They tended to be like a lot of what you find in the big organization. We just didn't know what was happening. And so SI 2.0 was, in one sense, a chance for us to figure out what we were doing. And it created a tremendous dialogue. Uh, having those folks come in with a completely different viewpoint of what we were helped us because they had perceptions about how to use the new media tool uh, to, to, you know, for us to open up ourselves. And it created a very interesting dialogue and dynamic within the Smithsonian because the Smithsonian, uh, if you will, it, we, we have different points of view because we have a lot of different people there. And, and the Smithsonian, some people would argue, for example, is all about perfection. That is, if we're going to put an object up, we hopefully know everything that's possible to know about it. We may still learn a few things. Uh, and that we've done everything we can to curate and preserve it for all time. We are forever, as we say, when we take an object in. Uh, and, and so it's hard for people who are in that mentality to say, let's go out there on the web and let things happen. You know, and, and you never know what's going to happen. And as one of our uh, folks said, it, Chris Anderson said, the web messy. And his argument would be, as soon as you get an object, put it out on the web. Don't curate it. Don't establish everything about it, but tell people we're still working on it, you know. And so it's been an interesting, it created, I, I think one of the outcomes of that was it created a wonderful dialogue. So we've had a mock debate between our folks, which was very fun and interesting about different points of view about the web. And we also know we've got a long way to go. It's digitizing 137 million objects is going to take some time. And you have to think about if it takes you 15 years to digitize 137 million objects, we'll you still have the devices at the end of it who can read that can read the things that you digitized in the beginning. I mean, they're all digital rot, some people call it. 
Uh, and so there are all kinds of technical issues that have come up, and it raises a whole series of institutional issues. Because, you know, if there are going to be revenues generated, how do you share the revenues? There, there are intellectual property issues. Uh, do we put everything out and just let it flow? Though, so uh, we are really into dialogue about all these issues. It takes a while to get there, but it's fun. Uh, questions uh, in the middle here. So, uh, we only have the one microphone, I guess. Huh? Keeps him fit. <laughs> yeah. First of all, thank you for a very enlightening uh, talk. My name is Mindy Reiser. I'm a sociologist who's worked overseas and in the United States. My question is about integration of the wonderful mosaic that is the Smithsonian with, in, within itself and with other institutions, such as the Library of Congress. You just had the extraordinary festival on the mall with whales and, uh, of course, music of the Americas and the African-American oral experience. How can you bring together the richness of the various fragments or pieces of the mosaic so that they interplay and interpenetrate and really capitalize mm -hmm. on what we are as Americans and citizens of the world? And as I said, the Library of Congress has its own digitalization project with incredible resources. Mm -hmm. So how to share the wealth and multiply it? Well, part of our effort internally when we did our strategic planning was to make it a, an inclusive bottoms-up process to some extent. And so people have had an opportunity. We've had any number of workshops where people across the institution began to talk to each other, some who had never met each other. And some remarkable things came out of those dialogues. We also are emphasizing the notion of collaboration. That's clear that everybody believes that this is an era where collaboration makes things work. Nobody, especially within a time when resources are very limited, Nobody can hire all the smart people. Nobody can have all the resources. Nobody can have, and in terms of our ability to uh, acquire new objects, it's very limited. We don't have the money to do those things. And so the key is collaboration. And we are in the process now of building out those collaborations. We have some. Uh, for example, the Harvard-Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory is a perfect example of that. Uh, but we have others as well that we can capitalize on. But we want to build out where there are clear affiliations that make sense for us. And Library of Congress is obviously one of those. We're having discussions with them as well. We're signing MOUs with the universities where we think that there's something tremendously to be gained. Maybe a basis is already there. Uh, and we are going to try to stimulate work with these different organizations by seed funding a little money to allow uh, collaborators to work together who come from the two institutions. We're trying to get people to look beyond the boundaries of the institution because the task is very big and we can't do it by ourselves. We'll, we'll, have, we'll have a lot of help, including this one. And uh, Sonia, right behind there. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Sonia Michelle, I'm director of the United, of United States Studies here at the Wilson Center. Um, I'm intrigued by your point about American identity being based really more on our history and our shared values and principles rather than being ethnically or racially based. And I'm wondering what that means for the Smithsonian as a collection of institutions, given that in addition to the Museum of Na uh, National Museum of American History, you also have the Museum of the American Indian, the African American Museum, and so forth. Uh, I wonder what direction that's going to take in the future. Are there thoughts about having other uh, specialized museums like Latino Latino or Jewish American or whatever? Uh, on the one hand, or are you thinking about ways to try to emphasize the the, the values based uh, the, the values basis of, of American identity rather than racial and ethnic uh, mm -hmm. principles? Yeah. That, that's a very good point, and I, obviously we want to try to find a common ground as opposed to the differences. We want to recognize that differences made what we are, but at the same time, there's common ground, and art and culture oftentimes is a common. Uh, thread, not one that differentiates us. Even sometimes religion can be that. Uh, so what we are is looking for those kinds of things. We have discussed this notion because if you think about the, the, the question you were asking, it relates to now, it relates to the past, it relates to the future. And in the future, when we have no majority, uh, will we represent America at that time? The Smithsonian is in its way supposed to, I believe, represent all of America. And if we don't represent all of America through our collections and the way we present materials and the way we do things, then we've missed something. And we certainly can't wait 20 or 30 years to think about this question because you have to reflect the contributions of all the different groups in our country through our collections. And collections take time uh, to, to acquire. 
uh, and particularly when you get strategic about them. In other words, we don't just simply wait for somebody to hand us something and say thank you very much. We're, we might say we need specifically to have more recognition of this particular part of our culture. And right now, for example, we don't have uh, what we need to represent in the African American sector. And fortunately, we are at that work as we speak. We have 8,000 some objects, I think is Brent, uh, that we've already collected. Uh, and the head of that museum is a person who worked for 30 years in, in American history and so has is that ethic in himself. Um, and so I think that's the key, is that we want to look at diversity not so much just as, in, 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 as something we would do in an individual museum, but something that you will see in our collections of music, our collections of photographs, our collections of objects, in our science, their contributions from many different you know, groups in our sciences. And we want to try to represent that across the board. And I think uh, the, the Smithsonian can't have a museum for every ethnic group uh, that came to this country. And we have to find a more holistic view of those issues throughout our, the way we do our business. We have to have, I, I think, every time we think about an exhibition, we have to think about it through the lens of American identity and what it means. And are we doing the appropriate, are we, do we provide the appropriate recognition for all the ways that contributions came in that particular exhibition? That's, that's a challenge for us, and it requires a rethinking, again, but uh, we're working on it. Okay, uh, quite a few hands up here. We'll have time, I think, for two more, Hunter, and then we'll go to the middle here. All right. Uh, Hunter Beechin from the Development Office here in the Wilson Center. You mentioned that it might take 15 years to digitize the entire collections out in the Maryland warehouse. That's a guess. It's a guess. <laughs> has it begun, and how much is it going to cost, and who's paying for it? <laughs> <laughs> Practical guy. Obviously, a development officer worries about those kind of things. Um, th it has begun, and it began a long time ago. There were people who 10 years ago or even 15 years ago thought about this and actually began digitizing things. And it's interesting to look back because we can learn something uh, from those experiences. And, and what we find is, is, in part, we can't read the things they digitize because the technology is gone. And so that, now we're thinking very seriously, since this takes a long time, is how do you do it in such a way that it can, in fact, be uh, useful uh, in, in future years. And it also, in that time, was not an institutional priority. And so uh, people did it sort of whoever was interested. So we have little pockets that people have done work, and it was good work, but uh, that was, uh, you know, it wasn't institutional. It wasn't looked at as a transformational technology. It was just an interesting idea. Okay. So that was, that was part of the problem. And then I think that timing is important in life. Uh, Lee and I are old enough to know that timing makes a big difference. If you try to do what we're talking about doing 10 years ago, it wouldn't have worked. The technology wasn't there. And coming back to the other question, you didn't have social networking. You had the Internet, but it was really a struggle to get other people into the conversation. And I think today the technology is far more robust and far more pervasive and you, you go back again 10 years ago and you say, well, let's put something on the web. And your first problem was, well, most people don't have computers big enough or powerful enough to get it, and you don't have the bandwidth. We're getting to the point now where those issues begun to move into the background. I think the timing is now. So, but now it's an institutional issue. Now it's a transformative possibility. And so we have to think through it in those terms. Where will we get the money uh, uh, as a university president uh, from anywhere you can get it is sort of the answer uh, for most of these things. Uh, which means you'll look for it, and that may mean donors can kickstart you. For example, Encyclopedia of Life, the MacArthur Foundation, Sloan Foundation have made huge gifts to, to get that started. Now, uh, we are putting it into our line item request for our federal budget because we realize we have to institutionalize this. We, we can't get to 1.8 million web pages just through our foundation resources, and so we have to put it in our institutional lifeline and, and lifeblood to make it work in the long haul, because we see it now as a very powerful force. And, and we also have in the FY10 budget funding generically for web access and digitization, because members of Congress and OMB and the administration all agree this is a good idea. And so I think you'll find a, we will continue to look for private resources to fund some of the spin-off efforts that we'll do and some of the ways we'll use them or configure the, the collections to work with people. But there will be core things that we'll do. And it will take quite time because we'll sort of triage the process. In other words, I don't think right now we need to put every one of our ticks online. You know, 
but there are certain things that might be very interesting to people and relevant about certain important subjects that we will do sooner rather than doing those later. Final question here. Uh, Howard Rosen, uh, U.S. Forest Service. Uh, also, I was born and raised here, so I remember when the Smithsonian was very little at one time. I have a question about its expanding size, which it has considerably over the last decade and will in the future. People are always happy about giving money when something starts, but it has to continue. Right. And my question is, what is your strategy and what are you going to do for the future for the maintenance of the facilities that are here and will be here? Right. And what, do you, what are the prospects for that looking out into the future? Well, a good point. And I don't think you're going to see the Smithsonian in, in sort of an expansion mode. Uh, as we will, because we are in the process, we're going to build the National Museum of African American History and Culture. That's a done deal. It's going to happen. That will be our major expansion. But if you look at our next major building project, it's actually renovating the Arts and Industries building, which is closed. So it comes back to your question of how do we use and work with wonderful resources we already have that are not being taken care of. And so, in essence, what we'll do is we'll reconfigure the Arts and Industries building to do some of the new things we're talking about. We won't build a new building for that. We'll use Arts and Industries to do, in fact, some of these educational outreach activities that, that I described. And so I think the trick is to do that. We don't see our collections growing. You know, people understand the collections, you were, were, as per, particularly would understand, how important collections are to the issues that we face as a nation. Uh, and, uh, and, and, but groups have gotten together. You know, there was just a new report that came out on national collections and collections in general. Uh, we all realize you can't, you can't afford these collections uh, and if they just continue to grow willy-nilly. As you may know, many universities in their present financial straits are getting rid of collections, which is a little scary uh, because there are objects that may be priceless and irreplaceable that you, you don't want to see get lost in some way. And people are getting much more thoughtful about what you add to a collection. We don't simply add something just because it would be nice to have it. We are very careful about accession. That's something our curators have gotten very good at. Do you really need a particular object or not? And we deaccession. In fact, the Smithsonian once at one time had 144 million things. It's now down to 137 because it has deaccession. Now, granted, a lot of those were stamps, uh, but we in inherited two huge stamp collections that duplicated, and we got rid of the ones that duplicated. Now we're working with the question about collaboration. We're working with other organizations to say, what do you have that we don't need, or vice versa? And so we don't duplicate each other unless you think it's a necessary duplication. So people are getting much smarter about collections. We'll be a lot smarter about our future in terms of what we do and how we do things. And a lot of what we will do in terms of this outreach will be virtual. Okay. All right, let's express our appreciation to the Secretary. Uh, <clears throat>